passages of Psalms is when we're going through trials and difficulties and fears, what's he doing? You know, I mean, we've got Psalm after Psalm after Psalm of, of David or other Psalmists, you know, praying to the Lord, singing unto the Lord. And uh, what we gain from the book of Psalms is the only place you're going to get comfort. The only place that's going to help you uh, find strength is if you go to the Lord. That's the, that's the key to the book of Psalms. And this is why anytime you're going through difficulties, you know, anytime you're, 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 you're having difficult, you know, just hardships, just, just go, I recommend, open the Psalms. You know, what you're suffering, what you're going through, your fears are no different to the fears that other men in the Bible have had. And sometimes when it's difficult to pray, you can just pray the Psalms. You go to the Psalms, find a Psalms that's applicable to your situation. Those are the words of God. You're not going to find a better prayer than what you find in the Word of God. You know, and you know, sometimes when it is difficult, you can just pray, you know, read that, read it unto the Lord, pray it unto the Lord, and tell the Lord, look, the same things that this man is going through, that's what I'm going through. Can you deliver me through these difficult times? And so, sorrow in the heart. I think we have uh, right now, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, a lot of sorrow in the hearts of people, a lot of fear. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of this has to do with not just the virus itself, but also uh, how the media, how the governments also deal with these situations. And there is always a push for fear. You need to understand this. You know, what we're dealing with, you know, I'm not saying there isn't a virus. Of course there is. All I'm saying to you is, you know, when, when the world wants to guide you and direct you, they're not going to lead you to fear the Lord. They're always going to lead you to fear something else. The, you know, the greater fear that they're looking for is for you to turn your eyes away from the Lord and turn your eyes toward maybe themselves or, you know, or other people. And as we're going through the end time series, we learn about the Antichrist and the, you know, uh, the beast. And of course, at some point, he's going to draw all men unto him. He's going to, you know, the pe people's eyes are going to be upon the Antichrist because we've gone through all those famines and pestilences and wars. People are going to be fearful. They're going to be looking for an answer, a solution. And there comes the Antichrist with his solution, you know. And so, you know, what we find in these difficult times, and, you know, this is a I've never lived through anything like this before. You know, even out the other hysterias that have been, you know, the Y2K and different viruses, the swine flu and the bird flu. And uh, I mean, what else have we gone through? I don't know. There's been many uh, end times prophecies, 2012, remember that, the Mayan calendar. There's always something going on, right? And but I've, never, I've never seen the world react the way they do, uh, that, or they have uh, with this virus, with this coronavirus. And so it is bringing a lot of sorrow in the hearts of people. And you know, we expect sorrow in the hearts of the world, you know, who don't know Christ as Savior, who do not have God, and, you know, the atheists that they think, well, if I die, that's the end of my life. You know, there's obviously fear to these people that don't have the rock of Jesus Christ. But, you know, we've seen a lot of sorrow in the heart of Christians as well. I think a lot of Christians are, are fearful, are afraid, uh, not knowing uh, what's going to happen, or, you know, will God see them through? Um, and so, as, again, I want to, as we study for this psalm, Let's, let's keep the context, but at the same time, let's take a greater spiritual truth and see how we can apply it to this, to this virus. Now, um, you know, what, you know I, I don't believe this is the end times, if you have that question. You know, I don't believe you know, we're at the end times. What we see with the seals, we saw the wars and the rumors of wars. Then we saw, or we saw conquering the nations, right? Or, you know, one major power conquering nations. You could say that's the United States. You know, they've got bases all around the world. You know, but then there are actual wars, uh, you know, and famines. There's a lot of, lot of uh, what the Bible describes, a lot, you know, the catastrophe is a lot greater that's developing in the earth. And then we see the, famine, uh, the pestilences come into place. So I don't believe, and it's pestilences, it's plural, it's more than one that's attacking the world. So, you know, I don't believe this is the end times. But I think what this situation allows us and the advantage, especially as Christians, that we have going through this time is that we can judge how we're performing. Like, how would we perform? How strong is our faith? You know, uh, and, you know, how would it be? You know, I think, you know, we, we look at uh, Peter, right? And when, when the Lord's saying, look, I'm, I'm going to be crucified tonight. I'm going to be arrested tonight. You know, and, and Peter's like, I'm not going to leave you, Lord. You know, I'm going to stay faithful to the end. I'll die for you. And then the next morning, he's denying the Lord, right? <laughs> he's already denying the Lord. And, you know, within 24 hours, he's denying the Lord. And um, so I think, you know, this is, you know, for Peter, that was a good test. You know, that was a good test to say, well, how was my faith? You know, when it, when it really got difficult, you know, I denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, by that self-examination for himself, he became a great Christian, became a great leader after the, you know, after the ascension of Christ. And so what I think the advantage for us is to see, you know, how well are we performing? How's our hearts? Do we have sorrow in our hearts? Do we have fear? Are we fearing the Lord? Are we closer to the Lord? You know, how are we reacting? How's our faith holding up? I think this is a great time to examine ourselves 
And if you find some weaknesses, listen, brethren, you know, I'm, I'm made of flesh and blood. You know, I have some concerns, some, you know, I wouldn't, I would be lying to say that I've never had any of those fears or the virus creep in a little bit. Uh, but overall, you know, I, I do trust in the Lord. I think one of, one of my personal advantages is being a pastor. Because it's kind of like, well, you've got you've to be an example, right? <laughs> you, you've got to be strong, you know, for your family, for your, for your church. And uh, so that's a personal thing that, you know, keeps you motivated, keeps you push, uh, pushing ahead, serving the Lord. And what I find in, the, in difficult times is, you know, some people will desert the Lord in difficult times. Some people will have, uh, be less faithful to the Lord, but some others will desire nothing more but to draw strength from the Lord. So again, I want you to be able to sort of just look at these passages and compare, how are you doing? You know, don't ask, how is brother so-and-so doing? How is sister so-and-so doing? Ask, how am I doing in light of the current events? So when you look at Psalm 13 verse 1, Psalm 13 verse 1, we notice immediately here a bad state that uh, David is in. He says, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? So as far as David is concerned at this point in time, the beginning is, the Lord's deserted me. He's turned his face away from me. How long is this going to go on, Lord? Are, 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 is this forever? You know, have you deserted me forever? And if you can keep your finger there, go to Ezekiel 39, 39 please. Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39. Because the thought would be, well, surely God has not turned his face against David. No, the Lord can turn his face away from you. Okay, that can happen. That's why it's here in the Bible. These things can happen. Go to Ezekiel 39, verse 23. But I want you to understand why would God do such a thing. Okay, now we know that, you know, uh, Jesus promises us that... Uh, you know, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. You know, when it comes to that promise, again, we're talking about our position with God. You know, we're saved, we're born again, we're a child of God, we have the righteousness of Christ. When God the Father looks at us, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we're His child. He'll never leave us in the, and, and uh, forsake us in that sense, okay? Our position before God. But don't forget, we have our walk with God. And you know, by our walk, you know, if our walk is filthy, if our walk is faithless, God can hide His face from us. And this is when you feel that God is distant. You know, you feel that God is not answering my prayers. And, you know, you, you'll have this sensation that, you know, just where is the Lord? Where is my strength? Where is my comfort? And it won't be there. But I want you to understand, it's not because the Lord's done something wrong. It's because you've done something wrong. It's because you've sinned against the Lord. Look at Ezekiel 39 verse 23. Ezekiel 39 verse 23. Of course, this, the application of this is with Judah. Remember how Judah had turned against the Lord? Then uh, this, is, this is all speaking about the prophecy of, of the Babylonian captivity to come and the people will be scattered. But let's take the spiritual truth unto us, verse number 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity. Why? For their iniquity. Why? Because they trespassed against me. What did God do? Therefore hid I my face from them. So why would God hide His face from His people? He just told us why. Because of our iniquity. Because we've trespassed against God. And brethren, if you're feeling that God is far away, it's not because He's far away. He's exactly where He's always been. Right? Jesus Christ is saying today, yesterday and forever, is that you've sinned against God. You've trespassed against God. And listen, if you're, if you're fearing this virus, you know, more than you're fearing the Lord God, that's a sin. You know, to put something in the place of God and fear something as though you were fearing God, that's a sin. And when you do such things, the Lord's going to hide His face from you, okay? It's because you've trespassed against Him. Let's keep reading. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword. Look at verse 24. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them, and hid my face from them. So again, God says, look, the only reason I'll hide my face from you is if you are unclean, if you have trespassed against me. Let's keep going, verse 25. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. So does God want to be merciful to those that have sinned against him? Of course, right? He wants them back. And the only way that Judah was going to learn their lesson was to allow them to go into captivity, to allow them to be in hardships and, 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 and these, uh, you know, away from their land, away from their possessions. This was going to be the thing that would bring them back to the Lord. God wants to give you mercy. 
And sometimes, you know, in order for God to give you His mercy, He's going to allow you to go through some hardships. And brethren, look, we all sin every day. You know, allow this, this coronavirus, allow the, you know, the, the concerns about this. Let it be a situation where you're asking for God's mercy, where you can self-examine and say, Lord, you know, I've got sin in my life. You know, maybe I've not confessed my sins to you for a while, Lord. Maybe there are major things upsetting me. Lord, allow this situation to break me. Allow this situation to be one where I'm seeking your mercy. Verse number 26. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. Look at verse number 26, just the beginning. After that, they have borne their shame. That's what we need to do, right? So our sin brings us shame, you know, and we need to get to that point where we're broken, where we have that contrite heart. We, 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 ha we bear that shame of the sins that we've done. Instead of being prideful and saying, no, Lord, you know, I don't care what I've committed, Lord. I'm not going to confess that. I'm not going to feel bad about that. No, you need to bring, allow that shame to fall upon you. Verse number 27, when I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. So God promises them, look, you get right with me, you bear that shame for the period of time, then you'll know that I'm your Lord thy God. They've forgotten the Lord God. They had forgotten. And so God allows this difficulty so they can remember who their true God is, right? And they come in shame of their sins. And look at verse number 29. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So does God want to hide his face from you? No, he wants you to be, uh, you know, with that, that uh, broken and contrite heart. He wants you to come bearing the shame of your sin confess it unto the Lord, remember that He is your Lord God, and then He will shine His face upon you once again. Neither will He hide His face anymore from, from them. And what does it say? He will pour out your, His Spirit. You know, if anything's going to help you through hard, you know, hard times and difficulties and fears, it's the Spirit of God. We need the fullness of His Holy Spirit in our lives so we can continue serving Him, continue remaining faithful. So what we learn there in Psalm 13 verse 1 is that sin will separate us from God. And we know that already, but we see that how, you know, when we see David speaking of, of God's face being hidden from him, it's because David's got sin. That's why he's trespassed against the Lord. And of course, when we sin, you know, you don't need to turn there. You can go back to Psalm 13, but 1 John 1, 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if you walk in darkness, if you walk in sin, you know, if you walk in the trespasses, you know, you break God's laws, you know, you can't have fellowship with God. It's going to appear, though, His face is turned away from you. It's going to seem like He's far away. It's going to seem like His distance. But then verse number 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So, don't forget that, brethren. You know, we sin every day. We're going to sin to the day we die. Don't forget that the blood of Jesus has cleansed you from all sins, okay? And so even the sins that you've done and you feel guilty and you're not going to the Lord and confessing them, they've been paid for already by Jesus. Just go and confess those sins to the Lord so you can be in fellowship with Him, so you can be walking in His light. So you can see the difference there. You know, the Lord promises never to leave us nor forsake us. That's our position before Him. But if we walk in darkness, we will lose the fellowship. You know, God will hide His face from us as it were, not because God's gotten distance, is that we've gotten away from the Lord because of our, of our sins. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Let our conversation be without covetousness, and be, con be content with such things as ye have. For he have said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. We need to remain content with what God has given us. Now look, my toilet paper supplies are running low. God says, be content, all right, <laughs> with what you have, you know, and look, we may, we may not have, you know, all the foods that we love to eat because the shelves are getting a little bit bare in the shopping centers. God wants us just to remain content, you know, just remember He's looking out for us, you know, and again, you know, as a father with a, with a big family, with a lot of children, you know, my biggest concerns are, am I able to provide? Are my kids going to be fed? Are they going to have a full tummy? 
by the end of the day. You know, I need to be content. God will take care of the rest of it, right? He promised me he will never leave me nor forsake me. And so, brethren, once again, if God seems distant, go and confess your sins to him. You know, I think this is a, an area where I sometimes forget, you know, to do this. And, you know, I think there's a lot, I don't hear a lot of preaching on this. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know what it is, you know. Go and confess. I don't know if it's because we, you know, as Baptists, we think of the Roman Catholic Church, and, you know, how they've got to go to the, to the priest and get into that little box and confess their sins, you know, say 10 Hail Marys and you'll be right with God. You know, but no, we, we need to go to the Lord God. You know, you know we, we can go directly to Him because Christ is our mediator. He's our high priest. He's given us that opportunity to, to be direct there in the throne of God. But we are called to go and confess our sins to God on a regular basis, not for salvation, but to remain that, you know, that faithful walk with God, that fa faithful fellowship with our Lord God. Psalm 13 verse 2. Then He says, How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Now before we read the rest of it, so we see that David is taking counsel, right? The Lord seems far, he's seeking counsel. Now there's nothing wrong with getting counsel in general, okay? The Bible, in fact, uh, many times instructs if you need wisdom, if you need guidance, go get some counsel. You know, we, the book of Proverbs is filled with, with taking counsel. But again, you know, the book of Proverbs is also, you know, warning you about what counsel you kind of, you get. You know, make sure it's biblical counsel, make sure it's godly counsel, make sure it's not the counsel of this world, but we know here that David is taking the wrong kind of counsel because he says, How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Listen, the, the counsel that David is seeking for is not alleviating the sorrow in his heart. It could be, uh, you know, escalating very much the sorrow in his heart. Not only does he have sorrow in his heart, he has it daily. Every day he's suffering with this sorrow. He's not getting the right counsel here. And then he says, how long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? And brethren, you know, we know the media. <laughs> we know they're there to, to bring fear into our hearts. You know, you know how they get ratings? By making you go back. You know, they, they get paid by the advertisers by making you go back. And if you're afraid, you're constantly going to be checking the media. You're constantly going to put on Channel 9 News and Channel 7. And what's the latest? What's, 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 the, what's the Prime Minister saying? What's the health organization saying? And you're constantly turning on, watching the, and, you know, the advertisements. They get paid. Okay? If they give you good news and say everything's fine, you're going to be like, well, okay, I don't need to turn it on anymore. I don't need to watch it anymore. But that's not their desire. That's not the goal of the media. Don't forget, the media is not a Christian organization. Okay? There might be some truth. I'm not saying there's no truth in there. But they're going to spin things in a way to get you addicted. Just like any television show. You know, you watch a television series. At the end of an episode, they leave you on a cliffhanger. So you can go back and watch it in the next episode. And you think you're going to get an answer. And then there's a cliffhanger at the end of that. It's like, oh, I've got to watch the next one. You know, and things like that. They, they never leave you satisfied because they want you coming, you know, coming back for more and more. And Brevin, you know, you could, you know, you know, you're going to get most of your information. Especially from the health, you know, organizer. Uh, what's it called? The... Um, World Health, well, not so much the World Health, but what's the Australian? I'd say, say the health department, let's say. You know, I think it's important to see what they're saying, what they're advising. But you know, you can read one article in about five minutes and be done. <laughs> and get the information you need. You don't need to constantly, 24 hours a day, every day of the week, be checking what the latest information is on the virus. And I'm telling you, by doing this, you know, you think you're educating yourself, but really you're bringing sorrow into your heart. You're bringing fear into your heart. That's the purpose of the media, to get you, uh, you know, going to them for help rather than going to the Lord. And brethren, I think if we just turned off our TVs, I think if we just turned off YouTube for a while and just got into our Bibles, I mean, look, you're probably, you know, more in quarantine than you've ever been, right? You know, probably some of your, your workplaces are asking you to work from home. You've got more opportunity now to, to read your Bible. If you've not read your Bible cover to cover, this is your chance. You know, even the world's saying, stay home, read your Bibles, do that, you know, instead of turning on the media. Listen, the Bible's not going to bring sorrow into your heart. The Bible's going to give you good counsel. It's going to give you strength, okay? It's going to alleviate those fears, brethren. And so it says here, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? I don't want the fears of this virus, you know. You know, as Christians, we have enemies. The world is our enemy. The devil is our enemy. You know, there are people watching us and seeing how are Christians going to react to this? 
You know, we don't want them exalted over us. We don't want them mocking our faith, mocking our walk with God. So be careful about the counsel you take in. Make sure it's the counsel of the Word of God. Because otherwise, yeah, like David, you're going to have sorrow in your heart daily. And I know this is a popular passage, but please turn there and go to Philippians 4. Say in Psalm 13 with one finger, but go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4 verse 6. And I know it's always more interesting to learn about disasters and, you know, the bad things in this world. But that's not what God wants us to have our minds on. You know, Philippians 4 verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Say, what does that mean? That that means I can't be careful about things? No, no. When it says careful, that means don't be full of care. Don't be full of worry is what it's being said here. Be careful for nothing. That's the message of the Bible, all right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So what's the teaching? Go to God. Take your thanksgiving. Take your prayer. Take your supplications, the things you need from God. Take it to Him in prayer. Don't be careful for anything. Verse number 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Listen, during this pandemic time, you can be someone that has the peace of God. You can be walking the streets, all right, going shopping with a big smile on your face, singing the hymns, praising the Lord, and the people will look at you and say, why is this guy so peaceful? Why is he so happy? Because it says here that the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Listen, the world cannot understand the peace that you can have during these difficult times. But what's it doing here? You've got to go to the Lord. You've got to bring, you've got to get your strength from the Lord. He shall keep your hearts and minds, it says here. He'll keep you established. He doesn't want you wavering. Verse number eight. Finally, brethren, and these things come together. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. Now, brethren, look, you know, like you, I've gone to YouTube. I'm sure you've done it. You know, you're trying to get different sides of, you know, this virus, you know, trying to find the truth. I don't think anyone's got the full truth. I'm sure everyone's got a little bit of truth. Maybe there are things that we don't even know that are really the truth. And, you know, all I'm saying is we could be buying into a lie or half truths. I don't know. But the only place that I know there's full truth is in the Word of God. This is the only place that I can be assured every, every, whatever verse I read would not be to waste because it's the full truth. And look, there are different opinions out there in the internet world. You probably have your own opinions. I've had different opinions as the days gone by. What could this be? What could it be? You know, be, what's the purpose behind this? All these kinds of questions. You know, is it just the judgment of God upon the world? Who knows? But here's the thing. I'm asked to focus on the things that are true. Let's go back to verse number eight. What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? Listen, going on YouTube and watching, you know, videos in China of people collapsing, you know, and, and blood coming out of their eyes or whatever. That's not lovely, <laughs> all right? Or whatever other videos, you're, you know, you might be watching of, of these viruses, that's not what God wants you focused on. If you do, that's where you're going to be fearful. That's where you're going to be worried about these things. We don't even know if these videos are even about this situation. You know what I mean? To, to get all these uh, uh, videos of, you know, CCTV and compile it all together, look, it could be videos of several of the last 20 years or so of different events going on and someone's packaged it all together to make it seem like it's just about the the virus. We don't know. (laughs) We don't know. I mean, think about how hard it would be for you to put out a video and get all the CC cameras, you know, footage and put it all into one video and publish it on on YouTube. There's a lot of these videos making the rounds on the internet about how, you know, all the Chinese are suffering. I'm sure they're suffering. I'm sure there are real cases of this. I'm not saying this is not real. All I'm saying is, Focus in your time on these things. That's not lovely. That's not lovely. Okay, it's, it's disgusting. Okay, it's not lovely. It says here, what sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What are you thinking about, brethren? What were you thinking about this morning? What were you thinking about last night? Were you thinking of the virus? Think on the things that are good, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are just. God wants us mentally focused on being good, being positive. Being positive. 
You know, we should think, okay, the whole world's afraid. I'm going to be positive-minded here. I've got the Lord God. The world doesn't have it. Hey, you know, Australians, they've gone through the fires. They're going through this pandemic now. You know, Australia is a nation where people think they don't need God. Well, maybe now they're thinking of God. Maybe now they're thinking of death. Maybe now they're going to be more receptive ever than ever before to know the truth. I wonder who's got the truth. Oh, that's me. All right. Praise God. It's me. It's my church. We've got the truth. We can be the light of the world, you know, in this difficult time, in these dark times. Verse number 9. Those things, Philippians 4, 9. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. What does he want you to do? He says, the things that you've seen, you've heard, you've heard preach, do those things. Hey, this is the time to be doing more for the Lord. This is not the time to stop, okay? We have the words of eternal life. I don't know about you, brother, I'm not actually afraid to die. You know, now look, what, have I been a Christian and there's been times in my life when I've been afraid to die? Yeah, of course, okay? But as you grow, as you mature in the Lord, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to die. I may have concerns, what happens to my family if I were to die? That's where my concerns my lie, but you know, that's where, you know, you, you take other things in consideration, and I think I've already done that, so I'm not that concerned about their future. But I want you to be careful about the things you're meditating on, okay? How many hours yesterday did you spend looking up the virus, you know, reading about the virus, hearing the news? How many hours? And then how many hours did you spend reading your Bible? How many hours did you spend in prayer? You know, how many, time, how many hours did you spend giving the gospel to someone that is lost and dying? You know, so I want you to have a good balance of these things. I'm not saying don't look at the virus, don't get information. I'm not saying don't spend some time on that. But look, I don't think more than five minutes. I don't think you're going to get any more. Someone that looks that up for five minutes, gets some latest information with someone that's spending hours and hours and hours every day of the week. You'd be at the same place with the information that you have. Back to Psalm 13, please, verse number three. Psalm 13, verse number three. Uh, and um, yeah, let's just read this. So uh, David says here, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. And that's the situation we're in right now. Everyone's thinking they're going to die. You know, or actually, except those that are at Bondi Beach. Did you hear about that? <laughs> The people in Bondi, they all, you know, flocked to the beach on, was it Friday or something? You know, they, you know, uh, so I guess they were okay. But you know, that's Australians sometimes, right? Australians sometimes a little bit thick. But, um, you know, here we see that David's afraid of, like, not afraid, but he's thinking that I'm going to die. You know, uh, you know I, I need to, I need the Lord to lighten mine eyes. I need God to brighten mine eyes. And uh, that's what we need. You know, we, we, we are, people are afraid of death. You have, like I said, you have the light. Of the, you are the light of the world. You have the light of the gospel. If, you're gonna, if anyone's light, eyes are going to be lightened, God's going to be using you to do that. Okay? And if you can please uh, keep your finger there and go to Ezra 9. Go to Ezra 9 for me. Ezra chapter 9. The only remedy for the fear of death is for God to lighten or brighten your eyes. It needs to come from God. If you look at Ezra chapter 9 verse 6, and again, this ties in with Judah being taken into captivity in Babylon, and then God promising that they will be restored back onto their land. And I want you to notice this in verse number 6. Ezra 9, 6, And said, O oh my God, I am, ash I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into, unto the heavens. So we see Ezra here, coming and confessing the sins, not just himself, but of his nation to God. And he's like embarrassed, right? He's saying, look, I, I can barely, I, I'm blushing. I can barely lift up my face and, and, and express, you know, our sins here. Verse number seven. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Verse 8, And now for a little, little space, grace have been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in His holy place. Look at this. 
that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So Ezra's coming, he's confessing the sins, his own sins, the sins of his nations uh, to God. He asked God for a little bit of grace. Verse number 8, For now have I a little space grace have been shown from our Lord, our God, saying, look, God is there with His grace, He's ready to have His mercy and grace upon us. And here he's asking that God will, will make lights in our eyes. You know, things seem dark, seem, things seem difficult, but he's now he's asking, Lord, can you light in my eyes? What is this about? He keeps going. And give us a little reviving in our bondage. Okay? So Ezra he is associated in lightening the eyes. We've been revived. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard of that term revival. You know, a lot of churches speak of revival. Lord, send us revival. Revival is not a word you see in the Bible, but here we have the, the concept here of being revived. You know, to, when you revive someone, you're bringing someone that's close to death back to life, right? Someone that's drowning, you know, they might be rescued by the lifeguard, and, you know, they might need CPR or something. They cough up the water, and they can breathe again. They've been revived, we'll say, you know? And what Ezra's asking is that the nation of Judah would be revived, that their eyes would be lightened. And brethren, if you're afraid of death, if, if, if you have a fear of this virus, you need a bit of revival. You need your eyes to be lightened. You, know, you need to go to God and ask Him, can you give me some of that life back once again? I need to come back. I want to be back where I used to be. That confidence, that zeal that I had for you, for your things, Lord, I need that back. And we need revival. You know, when, when uh, David's asking for his lives to be lightened, he's asking God, give me revival. And, uh, you know, we think that revival you know, in, in our churches, you know, we think that there's, you know, God's just going to, you know, snap his fingers and everyone's going to be full of the Holy Ghost and everyone's going to be up and praising God with their arms lifted up. And we're going to go out and win the entire world to the Lord. And they think that's revival. Now, look, revival happens within you. Revival happens when you go to the Lord, bow your head, blush a little bit, you know, be ashamed of your sins, have that broken and contrite heart. Say, God, I'm in darkness. Lord, I need your strength. I need you to give me a bit of life. I'm not serving you the way I used to serve you. I'm not excited about the things uh, that I used to be excited about. Lord, please bring some of that revival back and God will bring that into you. Listen, many times in the Bible, when we see the nation of Israel struggling in sin, God just needs one man. You know, God just needs a Moses. You know, God just needs a Joseph. You know, God just needs a Samson. You know, God just needs a King David. Usually it's just one man that's revived that's staying strong, that, that's got that power of God, and that one man can lead many. And, uh, you know, I hope I can be that leader for you in this church and for the fathers and husbands. I hope you can be that person in your family. I hope you can be that person that brings revival, not for yourself, but also for those that you have authority over. So, you know, let's not allow this situation to darken our hearts, to darken our eyes, to have the fear of death. Let this be an occasion where we have the greater light than we've ever had before. Let us be uh, people that are asking for God to lighten our eyes. Back in Psalm 3 and verse 3, uh, sorry, Psalm 3 and uh, verse number 4, Psalm 3 verse 4. Actually, before I read that, let me just uh, read Psalm 85 verse 5. And it says here, Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Okay, so we see another call for revive us. Will thou not revive us again? In fact, that's where we get the, the, term, the, the lyrics for that hymn. Revive us again. You know, that's that hymn. Well, we need the Lord to revive us, but again, it's when we ask the Lord for our mercy. And he said here in verse number 7, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Let's tie it into this virus. You know, we want to be saved from this virus. We don't want to be infected. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to pass it on, especially to the elderly, especially to those that are compromised. With this, we need God's salvation, and we need God's revival. You know, we need these two things, but it comes from God. Yes, wash your hands, you know. Yes, yes, you know, be, be careful with how you interact with other people. You don't know how this virus can be spread. But at the end of the day, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation belongs to God, you know. And God's still in control. God still commands the seas and the winds. 
God still commands it all, you know. And if you, know, if you have the virus, God can just stop it in its place right there where you don't infect other people. I mean, God can do whatever He wants. You know, He's got full power over these things. The virus is not out of God's control. You know, God's allowing this virus to accomplish whatever it needs to accomplish, okay? And just, you know, don't ever think that God has lost control over the events of this world. Now, the, the, the world has lost control, you know, uh, the, but we, we, should, we, are, we are people of God. We are people of God. We should be those that are revived and seeking to revive others, you know, that are close to death, that are on their way to hell with the beauty and light of the gospel. Psalm 3, verse 4. Psalm 3, verse 4. And I said to you how, our, you know, enemies are watching Christians. The enemies of, of, of God are watching Christians. Verse number four, lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. This is a constant theme in the book of Psalms as well, where, you know, um, the Psalms are saying how, the, how, the, how God's people are struggling, how they're going through hardship, how they might be, uh, uh, you know, fearful of, of being overtaken uh, by armies of you know other nations and there's a constant theme it's like god you know we don't want the enemy to think that they have uh you know uh strength over your people you know we don't want the enemy to to mock to mock you you know when you think of moses when he led the israelites out of egypt and how they were you know the israelites were um complaining and murmuring and god got so angry that he was on the verge of destroying the entire nation and Moses steps in and says, but God, what will the other people say? You know, what will our enemies think? You know, they'll, they'll think that you just brought us out here to kill us. Is that what they want? You know, is that what you want the enemies, our enemies to think about you and to think about your people? You know, this is something that, that's constantly brought up in the Bible. And, you know, God is mindful of what the enemy thinks. So we don't want, you know, to roll over and allow this virus to control every part of our lives, to bring fear into our lives because it will cause the enemies of God to mock our faith, to mock our, our walk with God, to even mock our Lord God. No, I want to see a smile on your face when you get out there in public. You know, I want to see confidence in you that, hey, I'm a child of God. You know, God can protect me. Oh, God can let this virus wipe me out, if that's what God's will is for my life. But I'm let, letting God be in charge of, of that situation, you know. And so be mindful of the enemies. Be mindful people are watching you, how you act. You know, how you react to the virus, how you're going to react during the tribulation to come in the future. You know, um, and look, you can set a good example to others. You know, your, the way you react in these difficult times could open the doors for others to want to have what you have, to have the confidence that you have, okay? We don't want our enemy to rejoice when they see Christians rolling over afraid. And I, there are Christians that are afraid. I mean, I heard of a family friend that's had a, a breakdown you know, about this whole situation. And um, she's a Christian. She's a believer, you know, and she's, um, it's, it's, it's too much for her. You know, she's had a mental breakdown. I, you know, the enemies will laugh and mock that situation. We don't want that situation in our lives. Verse number five. But, and this is where we turn the corner now, all right? So it says here, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. All right, so he goes, look, I, I know you're merciful, God. You know, I've got these sins, and I'm coming to you, Lord. I need the mercy. I know you've got it. I know your mercy is, your faithfulness is new every morning. You know, and that's the truth of God. When you're in sin, brethren, when you're ashamed, you know, God's mercy is always there. Just trust in his mercy. Trust that he can forgive, and he will forgive you. You come with that broken, contrite heart, he will forgive you. You know, you don't, once you're forgiven, say, well, God, I've messed up. You know, Lord, forgive me. Give me strength to not do that sin again. And just stop beating yourself up about it, okay? Uh, just trust in His mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. If you can please go to um, Psalm 86 for me. Psalm 86, verse 5. Psalm 86, verse 5. Psalm 86, verse 5. It says here, But thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call unto thee. This is our Lord God. He's ready. You're like, oh man, I can't face God with my sins and my fears. Oh man, 
God's like, hey, I'm right here, I'm ready. <laughs> right? My mercy is like, here, come on, come to me. Come and ask for forgiveness. God doesn't want you in this state of despair. Okay, He wants you to offload that. It's been paid for by Jesus. He wants you to do the great works for Him. I'll read to you from Daniel 9.9. 9. It says, To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. And we do rebel against Him. You know, we do so. And every time we sin, we rebel against Him. But the Lord is ready to forgive us. You know, the Lord's got this great heart, this great love, especially for His people. We need to draw strength to know that God is ready to give us the strength we need. Back to Psalm 13, verse number 6. Psalm 13 and verse number 6. And this is how we need to be, brethren. Psalm 6, that's uh, the last, uh, sorry, verse 6. That's the last, uh, that's the end of the, the psalm. All right, he's gone for despair. He spends a lot of time talking about this, the sorrow in his heart. But this is where he needs to end up in verse number 6. I will sing unto the Lord because he have dealt bountifully with me. You know when God gives you mercy and gives you forgiveness, that's been bountiful towards you. You know, that's more than you deserve. Okay? And we need to remember that, you know, God's forgiveness, His salvation, the heavenly inheritance that God has promised us, these are bountiful gifts. Okay? They're above and beyond what we deserve. We deserve none of it, actually. <laughs> we don't deserve any of it. That's why it's bountiful. Every blessing, every gift, every reward that God can give us. But notice it says, I will sing unto the Lord. That's how your heart ought to be. Brethren, this is what I, I want to ask this church to do something. You've got hymn books at home. You've got the internet. You've got the hymns. You've got the music. I want you to not just make a decision to read your Bible every day, especially during these trials, okay, during the fears of this virus. I want you to sing every day. I want you to open up your hymn book. I want you to go and find the lyrics. If you haven't got the hymn book, go find the lyrics on, on, on the internet. I want you to sing unto the Lord. I promise you it will change your life. It will give you strength. It will make you happy. It will put a smile on your face. You'll be able to walk out the doors and go, what virus? Who cares? <laughs> right? I've got the Lord on my side. We've got to get the song into our hearts. You know, and, and one mistake we often make, especially in church, is we think that singing is just for some people, for the people that have a great voice. You know why they have a great voice? Because they practiced. They didn't start with a great voice. No one starts singing beautifully like an angel. All right, get your kids to sing. See how bad they sound. Okay, the only thing that, the only thing that works is they're practicing singing every day. Brethren, the only way you're going to get better at singing and singing in church is, you know, practicing. Go home, practice, sing. Get your family together. Hey, guys, let's sing a hymn together. Let's sing a psalm together, whatever it is. You know, learn to sing. It says here, I will sing unto the Lord. So when you sing... You know, do it as unto the Lord. Do it as though you're standing and God says, you're in heaven. God says, all right, you know, Brother Jason, you know, come up here and sing me a song. How would you sing? <laughs> right? I mean, even if you've got the bad voice, right? You're going to sing with a full heart. You've got Lord God there. You're singing unto the Lord. You're not singing to me. You know, you're not singing to the song leader. You're not singing to this church necessarily, though we are to sing and teach one another, you know, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, those kind of things. But we're singing unto the Lord. Don't forget that, okay? And if you remember, who am I singing to? The one who died for me, the one who's forgiven me, the one that has given me mercy, the one who wants to give me strength, the one who wants to reward me in heaven. Boy, that's the one. That's my, my, my father. Above, you sing unto the Lord. If you can just have that in your mind, it's going to change the way you sing. And when you sing, I'm telling you, it has an effect on your life. I know when I sing, it has an effect on how I preach. You know, if I've got, sometimes I've got a bit of a sore throat. Not because I'm sick, because I've, you know, preached down in Sydney or whatever, and I get a bit tired, and I don't sing that much, I don't sing as loud, and I realize when I get up to preach, I just don't have it in me. I just, it's just, it's, you know, singing allows the Spirit of God to work in you, to strengthen you, to help you, you know, serve the Lord. Brethren, please be a singing person. I don't care how bad your voice is. You may never sing as good as some other people, right? We had the special item. Remember Annie and Alex and how beautifully they sang? Hey, that was a blessing to see how they sang. But more important than listening to, to songs is for you to sing. I will sing unto the Lord because He have dealt bountifully with me. Hebrews 2.12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Hey, 
you're having difficulty singing at home, come to church. Come and sing here. We'll teach you how to sing. If you want to be a song leader, you're, you're hired. Okay, get up here. Sing praise unto my... So look, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. When we come to church, we're going to the brethren and say, hey, I'm going to declare the name of God to you. I'm going to tell you that I trust him. I'm going to tell you he's my savior. He's my Lord. And, by, and the way I'm going to do this is by singing. The way I sing unto God is me giving testimony to my brethren how much the Lord means to me. Let's learn to sing. Let's have the songs of God in our hearts. And uh, so, brethren, you know, I was going to call this sermon Pandemic Self-Examination. But, uh, you know, maybe that's clickbait, I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Pandemic Self-Examination. But no, sorrow in the heart. You know, has this, uh, has this event brought sorrow into your heart? And I'm honest, yeah, it has a little bit. I'm sure it has a little bit to you. I'm sure. All right. But are we going to remain there? What counsel are we going to get? You know? And once again, I, I do not believe that we're entering the end times. But if we did, if we did, and things got worse, tribulation, persecution, pestilence is plural. You know? People that you trusted, your family, your friends, turning their backs against you. You know? I mean, how, how are you going to respond? I mean, think about how you've responded now, you know? And this is not even close to how bad it's going to get, okay? And if, if, if your faith has dropped, if your fears have increased, you know, you're doing less for God, you know, you're doing less Bible reading, you're doing less singing, you know, you've got to ask yourself, well, was I re- am I really ready? But, you know, don't feel bad. This is an advantage. This is an opportunity for you to examine and say, well, am I, am, you know, am I right? Are there weaknesses in my spiritual life? Are there weaknesses in my faith? And if there are, I need to get this right. So when the tribulation does come, I'm ready to face that. Like I said, Peter needed that opportunity, you know, to, to deny Christ and then to be embarrassed and say, I wasn't ready, Christ. But then he was ready later on. He was, he was very ready later on, you know. And uh, we need these opportunities. Take advantage. Take full advantage. You know, don't beat yourself up. Just say, look, Lord, I've, I messed up. I'm weak. I'm uh, you know, I've got flesh and blood. I've got a sinful nature, Lord. I've got the same fears, I guess, at the end of the day that I, I thought I had overcome them. I thought that I was going to remain faithful to you until the end, Lord. I thought I was going to, you know, never leave you. But, Lord, I, I kind of have, maybe, you know. And uh, please help me. You know, give me your mercy. Forgive me. You know, I'm a little bit ashamed, maybe, of, of the things that I've been thinking about and the way I've been behaving. But, Lord, allow this to be a learning lesson for me. Help me to, you know, like, like King David... Before David was able to take on Goliath, he took on the lion, he took on the bear, then he took on Goliath. You know, we need to allow these opportunities. You know, let's take this on, this pandemic. Hey, let's take full advantage of this. Let's try our faith. Let's ask God to examine us as well. You know, where are we at? What do we need to work on? And so how are you responding to this pandemic? You know, verse number one in the psalm was, you know, are you distant from God or are you closer than you've ever been? Verse number two, you know, what counsel are you receiving? Is it bringing fear or sorrow? Verse number three, was it, you know, are you preoccupied about death? You know, or are you seeking and experiencing revival? Number, you know, verse number four, you know, are you given opportunity for the enemy to scorn your faith? You know, our enemy at the end of the day is the devil. You know, Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. We don't want the devil, we don't want to give him place with this virus. Don't, don't let the devil, you know, find a foothold in your life because he's going to take full advantage of that. Remember, the devil's still going about, you know, uh, as a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. He's still active today, okay, the devil. He hasn't, he's not afraid of the virus, okay? He's taking full advantage of this opportunity to be that roaring lion. Verse number five, well, you know, are you trusting in God's mercies? You know, are you asking for his salvation from this virus? Or, you know, verse number six, are you staying positive? Are you singing praises unto God? You know, let's examine ourselves in light of these verses. How well are you performing during this time? And uh, again, you know, we can take some further practical steps about this. How prepared are we, you know, financially, brethren? You know, the people that are going to suffer the most because of businesses closing down, the economy is, is crashing, you know, it's, it's our dollars... Uh, we've, we've always known, if, if you know about finances, you've known that our money's never been based on anything anyway, right? So it's, it's, only, going back to, it's only going to where it needs to go, and that's zero at the end of the day. Okay, but at the end of the day, who's going to suffer the most during this time? People that live paycheck to paycheck. You know, people that have not, you know, put a saving aside. 
you know, ha- that people that have not prepared themselves for difficult times, they're going to suffer the most. And brethren, you know, let this be a lesson. Let, let it be, well, next time, I'm going to make sure I save up. Next time, I'm going to make sure I don't pay, you know, stupid money to, to different subscriptions of cable television or whatever it is that you're, you know, all the waste of money that you're spending on. You know, maybe instead of, you know, eating out every day, at Hungry Jack's or whatever, KFC, <laughs> whatever. You know, maybe I need to set that money aside and, and, and have a little bit of flour on the side, a bit of rice on the side in case of any hardships, in case the shops close down. Hey, we should be prepared. You know, as Christians, we, we've gone through Genesis. What, what did we see with Joseph? God told him, hey, I'm going to give you seven great years. You know, get ready for the hardship to come, the seven difficult years to come. Let's take the lesson of a great man of God and be prepared for these things, not just spiritually, but also practically. You know, God has given us our families to look after, to nurture, to lead. We need to be mindful about these. Let this be, a, you know, a time where you can say, hey, am I ready? You know, how, how well am I doing? Do I have a plan B? Do I have a plan C? You know, am I, am I ready to, you know, for, to go through these difficult times? Or your work for God? You know, are you doing less for God today? I think this is the time to do more for God. Honestly, and look, I, I don't know what the quarantine levels are going to be like. You know, I don't know if the government's going to say, hey, you can't go and knock doors on other people and preach the gospel. Look, that might come. And if that were to come, we just have to find some other ways to preach the gospel. You know, I do believe the government, and I want to make this clear, I do believe they have the power, they have the authority given by God to quarantine, to shut people up in case of disease or fear of spread of viruses. You know, we've got to give the government their rightful authority, which God has already given them. Okay, that, that, that was found in the law of Moses. That is something they can do. Okay? Now, of course, our government's corrupt. You know that. Of course, they're going to go beyond the measures that God has given them. Okay? But they do have that power. Okay? And so if, if they put certain restrictions, because of that reason, we need to be in obedience to that, I truly believe. But we just have to find some other ways. You know, we have the wisdom of God. We've just got to find some other ways to do what we need to do. We've got to find other ways to meet in church. We've got to find other... Look, if they say we can't be in a building, we'll go to Little Mountain Commons. We'll go to the park. We'll sit down on the grass. We'll have church there. All I need is a Bible. All we need is a few hymn books. We'll be fine. We'll have church... Probably have better church service than we've ever had, right? Out there in nature with the fresh air. We'll find a way. You know, if 10 of you have to be over there, 10 of you have to be over there, 10 of you over there, 10 of you over there... And, well, we need, you know, there's, there's still more people and we need more services. We'll do whatever it takes, okay? We'll do whatever it takes. And, uh, brethren, one, one thing I've noticed, and I'll just share this, you know, obviously I've seen a, a reduction in the offering that's coming in this month because of this issue. And look, at the end of the day, you know, that's between you and God, you know. And uh, I've been able to pay the lease for next month, so not to worry about that. But i noticed that we've been able to pay it a little bit later than what I normally would be able to pay it. So... Keep that in mind, but at the end of the day, I don't care if we lose the building, because the church is not the building, you know? Nothing's going to stop me from having this, the church, you know, the, the doors of church open. I don't care where it is. You know, if it's by the lake, we can do some baptisms, fine, okay, if, if there's time for that, you know? But we just have to be smart, you know? Let's allow the government to do what they have to do. God has given them certain powers, okay? And if they're at least obeying those powers that God has given them, well, good, I'll, I'll let them have that, Okay? Um, but let's be careful about how we're responding to this, uh, this pandemic. You know, not just church, but our lives, our homes. You know, how's our enemy seeing us? Are we stopping to do the work of God? I don't want to stop. You say, well, what about other churches? What about other pastors? That's between them and God. That's between them and God. Okay, and I realize that, you know, when it comes to times like this and pastors have to make certain decisions, they're going to be popular decisions, they're, they're going to be unpopular decisions. Whatever decisions you make in church, someone's going to be happy, someone's going to be upset. And that's just a decision you've got to make, you know. And one thing I want to make very clear as well in church, that if people decide to stay home and not attend church, again, and I, you know, I, I teach this extensively, every man has the authority of his home. Every man has the authority of his family. Every man is accountable to God for his family. And so if he decides not to be in church, fine. You know, he's got that authority. Just like the government has the authority to quarantine, that man has the authority to make certain decisions for his family. Okay? And, and we need to allow that. We need to allow, uh, uh, you, know, the, the, um, you know, the boundaries that God has given us and the authority that God has given us, 
you know, for different people, they, they might make different decisions than I would make. And that's fine. Other pastors would make different decisions than I would make. That's fine. I have to keep a clear conscience with God. You know, I've got to lead this congregation. I've got to set a good example. I personally think the place I want to be the most in any difficulty is in church. That's how I feel. But if others don't feel that way, well, that's between them and God. You know, and I'm not going to speak bad of them. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, make, make I, I don't want anybody to feel bad with the way, uh, you know, they are acting about this situation. I want everyone to just do that self-examination. How well am I doing, God? You know, do I need to work on some things, Lord? Hey, let this be something between you and God, your family and God. You know, it's not about looking at other people. This is the time we need to be united. This is the time we need to have one mind, the mind of Christ. This is the time that we need to, you know, support our brethren, you know, encourage our brethren, be prayerful for our brethren, you know, not mocking or not making fun or anything like that. No, this is the time for God's church to be stronger than ever before. You know, we can be the light of the world. We can use this opportunity, brethren, to, to do some amazing work for God. I'm excited about what's going to happen. I don't know, you know, I'm, maybe a little bit of fear at the beginning, but that's been replaced by excitement. I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm an ambassador of God, and so are you, and so is this church. This is the body of Christ. This is where the world needs to be turning to and asking questions. You know, God's church, what do we do? What's going on? How can I be right with God? So please, brethren, you know, use this opportunity to do greater works for God. Use this opportunity to do a self-examination of yourself. All right, let's pray.